Hi, and welcome to Mrs. Mummy Penny Talks with Ridley Wrights. And we are on to episode eight. Yay, nearly double figures. Um, and this week we are going to be talking about women and mental health, the very vast subject. Um, but before we launch into um, some of our personal experience and coping mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, let's just check in. How have you been? Um, yeah, amazing. Uh, the big news this end is that uh, we have a new member of the family, my fur baby. Uh, so we've got a lab- first child. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a Labrador puppy. She is just over nine weeks old and uh, she is, yeah, asleep behind me. It's one oh. of the reasons why I'm in a different room again today to, the, to, to where I normally am. Um, but yes, so... Um, Word of warning, uh, she may, who knows, we may get bombed by a Labrador puppy at some stage. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's one to look out does for. Does she sleep a lot? Um, yeah, yeah, she does. And she's, she's, everybody said to me when I said I was getting a puppy, they were like, oh, it's worse than having a newborn. You're up every two hours in the night. And um, uh yeah it's and we've been really lucky so far i don't want to curse it now but we've been really lucky so far i mean dave goes to bed late and i get up early so and you still have a young child that wakes up in the night as well <laughs> well yeah well although he i mean yeah occasionally although he, he he didn't i mean at last couple of nights she slept sort of well i think i'm sure i would wake up but she slept <laughs> for sort of five six hours so that's good um yeah so no um it's going really well so far that's lovely yeah amazing, uh, amazing and the kids my god you like, they're in amy, love with her but they both are but i mean amy is like talk about one one girl and her dog she <laughs> just she just follows the dog around giving a running commentary of everything she's doing mummy mummy she just went down the steps mummy mummy she's in the garden she just sat down she's scratching her ear it's it's um it's amazing and then it's not going to start annoying you well, at the moment, it's still deeply cute. Um, but uh, last night, she was sat on the steps in the garden with the puppy, giving the puppy a cuddle. And she had no idea. I took a picture because it was really cute. She had no idea I took a picture. And I overheard her saying in these really hushed tones, I love you so much, puppy. <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God, I can't take this. This is cuteness overload. So, yeah, so that, that's me. What about you? How's your week been? Yeah, no, I've had I've had an amazing week. Um really nice weekend where my nephew Matthew um who is not the age of a nephew he's more like a brother um came up for the weekend and Dylan had a really big football tournament um so very exciting to have an actual football tournament that we're allowed to go to because normally they're in Germany um and parents aren't allowed to go uh so yeah it was uh with West Ham um Norwich uh Stevenage Wolves so some pretty big teams and they won the whole yeah. tournament it was very oh, wow. exciting that's amazing that's and Dylan great. was the captain um yeah it was it was a long old day it was like nine till six um but it was it was so amazing and like all the parents were like crying and going mad even Dylan Dylan cried as well it's so sweet you walked past me I said to Matthew oh my god I think that Dylan's crying he's just so emotional about it but oh so that was really really cool um and then um yeah we went to a restaurant because we're allowed to eat in restaurants now went to the cinema on Sunday I've just done lots of things that we're now allowed to do so it's been amazing we actually yeah sorry just to chip in on that we we went to sussex at the weekend which is which is where oh, yeah. we came from um and visited um dave's family and went to dave's um dave's sister's 30th birthday party which was a barbecue and it was very strange being out socializing uh it's again. weird isn't it yeah it and feels, it, it feels so normal but yeah there's still moments where you sit back and think oh wow this is amazing that there's like so many people at a football tournament or yeah we're sat in a restaurant enjoying a toby carvery roast dinner (laughs) Uh, and and actually leading on from our episode episode last week about women and alcohol i um went out last thursday with my um old work team and did indeed get totally drunk had great fun 
Um, yes, and really suffered for about two days afterwards. Like, is it really worth it? Spent mm -hmm. an absolute fortune and suffered for two days afterwards. I, I don't know. Is it? Where worth are you it? falling on that? Is it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, on, on Saturday, I, um, in that sort of nervous excitement of, of being at a party, downed um, <laughs> three very small glasses of Prosecco and then immediately went over to Dave and said, I can't drink anything else for the rest of the party now. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm done. Uh, so, yeah, rapidly kind of uh, moved on to softies after that. So, yeah, never mind. There we go. There's the difference. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, at least you didn't cane a hundred quid in the process. London. Anyway, anyway, yeah. So, um, right, women and mental health. Um, so it was it was Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and it, I think it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Is yeah. the month of May, but um, I, I, we shouldn't just talk about it in that week in that month. It should be a ongoing conversation that you know we just keep it bubbling along, because I really do think um, the more, uh, particularly people in the sort of public world talk about it and are honest about it and share what struggles they've gone through like it really helps when celebrities share the struggles they're going through and I, I I know it sounds a naff thing but it really really does help to dispel the myths around it mm -hmm. and um I, I try to have the conversation with my children as well like um a broken leg is is very visible and you get a lot of sympathy for it but all mental health issues are is a, you're a little bit broken in the head so it's still something that's broken that mm. needs to be fixed so um mm. it's just as obviously it was it's probably a lot worse than a broken leg but um yeah just to get that concept over to them because they are learning about mental health stuff all the time at school but it's it's a difficult one to relate to children it was, it was something uh, it was something I wanted to ask you about, actually, because um, I was thinking about how it really wasn't something that was talked about when we were at school. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I was thinking about, you know, later on, as you say, we're going to talk about coping mechanisms uh, and, and what have you. And I, and I feel like that's something that we would all benefit from being taught more about. You know, it, I think we're not quite there yet, but I think, you know, they are doing more things around mindfulness and, and building resilience in, in, in school. So yeah, I'm really interested. What's the, what's your experience been of that with the, with the boys? Um, so yeah, mental health support at school is apps is at, sec, at primary school and secondary school. Cause I have, because of going through the divorce, then we've had to rely on these resources mm -hmm. for the boys. Um, there are um, in-school counsellors that you could like, you can literally get booked in for that week. Um, you can have as many sessions as you want with those counsellors and that's open for everybody. Um, at, at primary school, there is like a, what's the right words? There's like a, she's not a counsellor, she's like the sort of um, well-being, mental mm -hmm. health um, person. I think she's called a Senko. Mm -hmm. um person i don't even know what that stands for that's not very special good. education needs coordinator thank you um <laughs> but yes but she she will have one-to-one -one sessions um and she has definitely done that with my um younger boys so yeah the, there's so much help and support um and yeah they talk they talk about it very openly um and it's it's it just seems to be not um as shameful for children as it well we didn't even i didn't even know it existed when i was growing up literally like there must have been people around us that were sad or depressed but it, it i just i just don't remember it happening yeah yeah no i think you're I think you're right um should we kick off with a few facts and stats yeah. about women and um, and mental health? So uh, I did a, a little bit of a research before we before we. You're the, you're always the stats person. I love it. Should be me as the stats person, as I've got a degree in like maths and statistics. <laughs> Anyway. But these are the great similarities between us that despite where we went educationally, there are there are, we, there are a lot of places that we meet in, uh, yeah. like stats and. Um, writing beautifully anyway um yeah so i uh I had a look and uh the figures are really interesting so um we've got 
26% of young women experiencing anxiety or depression. This is from um, the Women's Mental Health Task Force report that was commissioned by the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a quarter of young women experiencing anxiety or depression, which um, is in comparison to 9% of men in the same age group. So it's, it's wow. definitely, yeah, quite significant. There is an issue there about whether there is um, some underreporting going on um, mm. with the guys. So it's not, it, the disparity may not be quite so great. It may just be that they're not, uh, they're not coming forward with that. Um, again, mm. you've got 20% um, or one in five, 60, 16 to 25 year old um, women reporting recently self-harming so wow. that's, that's really 20 percent yeah yeah um and um and suicide rates in women are, are at the highest uh, they've been for about a decade with um rates of suicide and self-harm being higher for women in minority ethnic communities compared to other women as well so you know even within that women group it it, it very much varies on um, your your background and circumstance as well, which I think is fascinating. And just to be really clear, those are that 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 second the second sets of stats came from the Mental Health Foundation, um, based on a, a study that's a little bit older, twenty sixteen. So um, yeah, some of those stats are probably changing there. So yeah, it's definitely a key thing, um, and um, a, a, and it's very much affecting um, women. There were some positive things in there. I don't know if we want to pull those out now. Yeah. So um, one of the one of the things that um, was noted is that women's mental health is um, is is actually protected by having better social networks generally than men. Um, we find it easier to confide in friends, and we're actually more likely to be treated for a mental health problem. And, and again, these stats are quite significant. So twenty nine percent of women. Um, get treatment versus seventeen percent of men, which uh, which is which is interesting. Um, the reasons there are some very um, gendered reasons for for it. So um, mm. one in uh, one in four women experience depression versus one in ten men, um, and causes for that often around pregnancy and birth. Um, and then also there's a an issue around because um, we live longer. Um, you're more likely to experience depression um, when you're older. And again, there's, there's um, uh, social isolation um, that, that comes into that as well. Um, but yeah, and then also um, as, a, as a woman, this, I found this fascinating. As a woman, you're more likely to live in poverty. You're more likely to be socially isolated and um, you're exposed to more sexual violence than men. And all of those things um, are kind of key um, underlying factors to um, to your well-being and, and uh, mental health. So yeah, yeah, that's scary. I um, the the standout <clears throat> stat from that is that twenty percent of um, was it sixteen to twenty four year olds have self harmed. I they had recently self harmed. Wow, and but what so what counts as self harm like? say binge eating uh, eating disorders are they part of self-harm or are they they're a separate issue i i understood it as actually physically cutting. injuring yeah, yeah mm. cutting yeah yeah, yeah that... I mean, there are. i mean it's terrifying isn't it but I mean, there are all sorts of websites and chat rooms that you can go to to find out how to cut yourself in a way that yeah. um is uh well disguised from parents and carers and friends so yeah i mean you know, I think it's there's a definite thing there, but that's maybe a whole other issue for us to to come to. Yeah, time, yeah. But yeah. yeah so it's quite, you know, it, it certainly makes quite grim reading. And and I mean, the 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 government report also looked into, um, also highlighted that there's a there's a mix of multiple needs. So even when women um, do get into the um, system to get help, um, there is there there are lots of issues and challenges there, but also. Um, there's this issue that you're often looking at women who um, have experienced violence, physical and emotional, they've uh, abused, they're, they're experiencing poverty and inequality, they're facing issues of addiction and often homelessness as well. So you're, you're often seeing a very complex picture and, um, and, and, and a lot of the feedback is that the, their experience of going into, um, 
into the system to get help is is not all that positive so there are the key issues that came out were people didn't women didn't feel that they had their voice was heard or that they had any control once they entered the system there were issues of accessibility um, lots of women wouldn't didn't feel comfortable even asking for help particularly if they had children because they were scared their children would be taken away from them mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so they would prefer to just kind of soldier on uh, mm -hmm. by themselves and um, there's a, a lack of understanding of the trauma element that might be underlying some of the um, mental health issues and so there's a sense that when you go into some of these um, institutions you end up re-experiencing the trauma that is underlying the issue in the first instance if you're physically restrained etc yeah i've got while while you um touch on institutions i've got a um really interesting uh story not a personal experience it's um a friend of mine who i actually interviewed um i've done i did a podcast with her last year so i'll maybe stick the link to it and she's mm. she talks quite openly about her experience so um jennifer kempson who um otherwise known as mama Fafa, she's this like huge um money youtuber um she's she's done it so so well at it um makes a lot of money from it but um she's a lovely girl and she had a breakdown um ooh, maybe like three years ago two years ago and she was like there was nothing that caused it it just came from nowhere um and and she describes very eloquently sort of what happened on you know that day where her world sort of fell apart she ended up um sectioned um but she very quickly recovered from that sort of that that day trauma event but she couldn't get out of the institution oh god because once you're in it's really mm. difficult to get out even though she was like i'm completely of sane mind i don't need these drugs so she ended up having to like go to court to get a court order to get her out of the um institution it was yeah awful. wow just an all and like she's she's like you and i she's she's like a regular mum, and she she shares this experience she's gone through and it, it just tears your heart out but it but that's just like that's honest to god like reality of you can look completely normal from the outside and you know be this happy whatever person enjoying life but you just never know what's sort of underneath it and and that you can just suddenly one day just go yeah. into that psychosis almost and and i, mean, I, 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 I think some the other kind of underlying trauma i suppose somewhere that that i'd i'm, I'm not a psychologist so mm. i can't speculate but um mm. a, a lot of um a lot of the um reasons for mental health issues as an adult is things you've been through as a child things you've experienced and it doesn't necessarily have to be something huge like um losing your parent or being raped or it, it can be something um like i, I don't know your, your dog died when you were a child or but so, so these these events can lead to all kinds of trauma in later life and um mm. i was talking to a child psychologist um a couple of weeks ago and he's like all he's about is sorting out those psychological issues for children when they're children so it doesn't come back to um mm. hurt them down the line and he shared his story with me i have so many people share their like personal stories with me it's um People just like to tell me stories, but it's I'm, I'm so honoured that people do this. But he, um, yeah, he was he was abused as a child, and he held it in, didn't tell anybody. Um, ended up, you know, in a job, got married, and his marriage fell apart, and just everything sort of started to go wrong. And he didn't deal with it till he was like in his forties. So, mm -hmm. like when these big events happen, you sort of have to deal do your best to deal with it at the time because yeah the repercussions years and years down the line are just um could, could be I, I think that the, the your, your first friend that you mentioned uh, i think what's really interesting there is um i suspect she's probably i mean what would you would you say that she's like us in, in as much as she's white she's middle class she's 
you know so so actually she's she's reasonably privileged and mm -hmm. had to fight like hell to get out of the system mm -hmm. um you take away some of those advantages and uh and and that's that scares me that there's a system that you know it might be very hard to access but it's also incredibly hard by the sounds of things to pull yourself back out of it again yeah um, and and while we're talking about privilege um mental health supports is a huge privilege that um if you have money and you're white um suddenly it becomes a lot more accessible to you um because so so you you um you're a woman you've got postnatal depression or you are feeling that things aren't right you go to the doctor i mean every nhs trust is different but the waiting lists for counseling is what you will generally be referred to up to a year waiting yeah. for a counselor you need that help then and there so as a privileged person with money then you you go out of the nhs system and you end up in private therapy and it's just it's not right is it it's just not right because no. if you if you broke your leg you would go to the hospital and it would get fixed that day so mm. why are people having there, there there was um there was something in the news i was actually just trying to google it quickly to get the the the, the detail of it but I, I couldn't there was something in the news i think last year about um um a lack of access particularly for black and ethnic minority groups for their mm. for, for getting access um to to even the stuff as you say even the stuff that should be freely available um but also um the other thing that shot through my mind was to do with a personal story which which is that when um my dad died and i was in my very early 20s and um, i really felt like i needed to talk to somebody so as you say counseling was was one of the things i was thinking about um interestingly enough it was my first brush with with cruise and obviously it's um you know it's a funded organization and um whenever i called um it was outside of their office hours so i, I tried a couple of times and gave up then i went to the doctors um and i and i sat in the doctor's surgery in, in oxford and said um that i just felt i needed to talk to somebody i didn't feel like i could talk to my friends my mum and my sister were obviously devastated by it and i and i really felt i couldn't trouble them with how i was feeling that felt like a really selfish thing to do and he sat there and he said to me well the waiting list is six to nine months and uh, and he sort of looked at me he said no, don't i doubt that you could afford to pay for it privately and um he said but what i can offer you is prozac and um and I said, I, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And he said, well, if you're worried because it's a drug, you can always try St. John's wort, which is, you know, um, something that you can get over at the counter. It's a herbal remedy. He said, although it will stop the pill from working for you. Um, and then he got a book down from the shelf and pointed to a chapter that explained to me that what I was probably suffering from was depression. And it was the common, a common cold of the mind. He said, his last thing was that I should go to Blackwell's bookstore and find some books on it to help me. <laughs> that was what was offered to me so yeah i mean i went to the bookshop obviously that was a that was a good good call but um but yeah uh, it, i was really surprised and and that was m me from quite an innocent background assuming that i could just go to the gp and mm. and that i would be um would be offered something that wasn't just medication yeah i've i have um so i have been in and out of counseling and therapy most of my adult life um, and I have never been to the doctors about it never ever mentioned it I've always just gone the private route or um, yeah my first brush was it was with it was at university so obviously that was funded by the university and I had like counseling for about a year so that was quite close after uh, mum and dad dying um, and um yeah i've tried all sorts of different things i i almost feel like my life has just been constantly trying to find that perfect therapy that will fix this is all going to come out using the wrong words but it's the words i want to use that that i've got stuff going on in my head that i need to fix and and for them not to impact me going forward like i I really, really struggle in the winter and um, 
it, it, it's really like impactful on life. Like I, I, I'm a like gregarious outgoing person. Like I'm the life and soul of the party in the like spring and summer months but like in November and December, like the, the Christmas party season is the biggest like anxiety thing for me going because I, and, and I've like not gone to a Christmas party just because I couldn't face that time of the year. And January and February are just horrible, horrible months. And I don't want to be like that every year because it's not fair on the people around me, but I just, I can't quite find that like perfect, that, that fix. So what's going on in my mind? Um, so yeah, I've tried counselling. Um, counselling for me wasn't like strong enough. Um, so counselling is like talking therapy. Um, my nephew actually is, is I'm training to be a counsellor at the moment. So he's sort of been sharing with me the process he's having to go to, to learn. How, and it takes like years mm. to um, qualify to be a counsellor, which I didn't quite appreciate. So he's not going to be practicing for at least another couple of years. Um, and then even when he's qualified, he has to get a hundred hours of um, actual in real life practice before he can then go off on his own. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, counseling, I've always found quite light touch. Um, I've paid for it privately and it can vary in price, but um, I, I've normally paid about 50, 60 pounds an hour, which is a lot because the thing with counselling is you need a, quite a lot of sessions. Mm. So if you think you're in counselling for six months, mm. 200 quid a month, that's more than a thousand pounds on counselling. Um, but I, I discovered a really good therapy last year, which um, was um, quick, uh, quick acting. So it's, um, it's called human given, human, yeah, human given therapy. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, well, I've talked yeah. to you about it, but um, so it's it's all to do with um, PTSD trauma events, which you know a lot of our mental health issues come from these trauma events, and um, it's um, again uh, Jennifer, a different Jennifer, who was my therapist. I've interviewed her, so she's she's talked about it far more eloquently than me. But within three sessions with her. And I think it was about 90 or a hundred pounds a session. So 300 quid. Um, we were able to go back to traumatic events and um, completely like remove them from my mind. I mean, I, I've, I've got quite a few traumatic events in my mind and we only focused on one in particular, but um, I can now look back to that one particular event and I don't feel any sort of, emotion or anything to do it and it's all done via your subconscious mind and um sort of mind mapping going to a beautiful place and um having your traumatic event on a video being played and rewound and stuff and it all sounds very it's, airy. Um, it, it's, an, it's an element of hypnosis involved in it isn't it and yeah then it's a little bit yeah and rewriting the the emotion that you, the emotional narrative that you've attached to that particular incident. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's typically used for um, soldiers with PTSD from obviously seeing horrible stuff in wars. Mm. And um, again, I've got another, <laughs> all these people tell me, I think cause I'm a very open person. People just share their stories, but yeah, one of my friends who was in the army um he had PTSD and actually had the same therapy that I had. And he was like, I'm a completely different person. And like before I had that therapy, he was a total nightmare. So um, mm-hmm. just struggling with everything. So yeah, it, it really works. I just, I just love the, um, and in, it, it, it is like medically, it's got yeah. you know, proof and stats yeah, behind yeah. it. It's not but, a quack thing here, yeah. But I, I think, but again, it's still a privilege because, you know, I had that 300 quid to, to um, pay for it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would just never think of turning to the NHS. But actually, Jennifer, the therapist, she had quite an interesting argument about um, mental health support where she's like, literally, if you have the money, then you should not be going to your doctor and getting it on the NHS if you can afford it go get it privately and free up the space for the people who can't um, and try and get those waiting lists down a bit shorter. Mm. But yeah, I doubt, doubt you're going to get that kind of, uh, for serious issues, you can get that level of therapy, but mm. 
it's yeah. just a long waiting game so yeah it's a shame it's a huge huge shame and a couple of things i want to pick up there i mean one i i want to just sort of share which is that i know like we we chat on messenger whatsapp um regularly um throughout the, the the week and 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 you know often several times throughout a day um and and i recognize i know when the season has changed because you vanish yeah. um, and it's it's always really interesting sort of on the one hand you know and and this is thinking about how you support somebody who has um mental health issues because as a friend i want you to know that i'm there but i also don't want to be a pain in the ass going how are you doing are you all right because you're not and i know you're not and i think one of the sometimes one of the worst things that anybody can ask you is how are you doing when because it puts the onus on you i mean i i know i for different reasons i felt guilty kind of saying to people that i'm not really all right it's quite a big thing to admit that you're not all right and especially if if you feel like there's nothing that person can do to make you feel better either so mm. i think the first thing i wanted to to ask is like what what's the support that you you need at that point in time G given that that that's where you're at what 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 would you be looking for yeah um so i think i think actually the support you gave give to me is what you is is um what you need so you would um and I, i've got i've got like a couple of friends like you that just are constantly checking in so it's it's like a message every couple of days just like are you okay um and then i know we had a few like um zoom conversations where i think i just cried at you um which i I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to burden you, but obviously it wasn't a burden on you because you're yeah. the one that wanted to do it. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. You couldn't resolve anything that I was feeling or thinking, but it's just a person mm. watching you cry on a, on the end of a zoom call. But yeah, no, it's that constant checking in because then you know that somebody is thinking about you mm. because particularly, um, I, I January and February were fucking awful. Like they were the worst two months of probably mm. my entire life with with depression. And um, I was alone for half the week. Uh, Christmas was cancelled. Um, yeah, yeah, of and just just everything. Um, and plus, there was like horrible stuff going on, like family. Mm. Um, just horrible stuff it was just it just it just felt like everything was going wrong at the same time so to have um a few people just checking in on you regularly mm. and you know sometimes all, all you'd get back is a yeah i'm doing all right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's that's um so yeah if i suppose that's the what what can you do to help your friends or whoever that's in need just just let them know that you're there for them because there will be that time when that person is ready to you know, have a telephone call or a zoom call and cry their eyes out to you uh, yeah and I, and I think there's something else i wanted to pick up on is this idea of um of of, of fixing ourselves mm. um and, and i'm really conscious that there's a there's a line here isn't there so there's a degree of you know <sighs> There's a degree of uh, being unhappy. There's a degree of um, life not always feeling brilliant that, that, is, that is really normal and that actually probably what we all, um, or what many of us need to get better at is, 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 is recognizing and accepting that sometimes we are sad and actually it's, it's fine to be sad and we need to learn how to be sad. We need to learn how to be all of our emotions actually um, and mm. not, um, put happiness on a pedestal, which I think can happen culturally. So, so there's that. But I, I guess it's about knowing what that line is between um, between being at one with your emotions, being able to live your emotions as they're actually happening, and and when when it tips over into that um, impacting your ability to to live life i suppose that's 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 the crossover point isn't it that's the bit mm. that you might start to say well this this needs something happening to it because i can't function and you know i think one of the things i'd say for, for you is obviously as um 
somebody who runs her own business, I think one of the impacts that you go through is not being able to take on so much work during those months. So there is an element of, it's not just about wanting to be out in the party season at, at Christmas time. It's about being able to, um, yeah, maintain your, your, your business, I suppose, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I'm not sure this part of me will ever be fixed. No. I think I just need to be accepting of the fact that my mental and body cycle flows with the seasons, <laughs> which, which is, is not sort of indifferent to probably how people lived hundreds and hundreds of years yeah. ago. You, um, yeah, I, I go. So, so do I just accept that I go into hybrid? I, 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 um, do all the work in the summer months and, you know, build up the income and and then it sort of flows from there into the um colder months when i'm in hibernation mode mm -hmm. so yeah but it's just getting to that point of acceptance that's my next challenge of accepting that that's okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i don't know it's very very difficult one mm -hmm. i'm a very complicated well we're all we're all very complicated, we're all complicated yeah what are your coping mechanisms though when you're um when you recognize, because I suppose that's the other thing, is it? Is it recognizing that's where you're at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, so the most powerful one um, is forcing yourself out for a um, walk into nature through the woods, um, away from a road, if that's possible for people watching or listening. Um, yeah, walking around a field and sitting on a tree, just really really engrossing myself in nature listening to podcasts that was a huge huge help as well but I was I, I really I did force myself out every day um, and we were in lockdown as well so there was even more reason to force yourself out as well but um yeah it's it's focusing on those like healthy coping mechanisms um I have tried meditation so many times, but I just can't get on with it. I just can't. <laughs> I know it works for so many people. Um, so yeah, there's some amazing apps that you know, encourage that daily practice. It only needs to be five minutes a day as well, doesn't it? But mm. I have I have managed to do it when I've been um, like in, I don't know if you've ever been like in a deep act, Chopra um, WhatsApp group where you've got like 10 people on this 21 day program and you feel really stressed out if you don't do it every day so it forces oh you to do it oh god that sounds awful <laughs> that sounds like the antithesis of what it <laughs> <laughs> I have done what I have done a couple of those 21 day meditations I think they're very good but um yeah no this was added added pressure and then yeah. at the end of it it was like your task for day 21 is to set up your own whatsapp group and to like i was like there's no way i'm doing that like i'm not it's it almost like turned into like a chain thing but um it's a bit of a challenge that you, you know it doesn't it, it needs to be something that fits in your life doesn't it it yeah, can't yeah. it can't be another well it can and it and it and it does you know I, I've, I've talked to lots of um female friends about the sort of the list of really healthy practices that we're all trying to do before the day starts. It's like, Oh, get up, meditate, write your journal, go out for a run, sit in the garden with a coffee and be grateful about everything. <laughs> it's like, Whoa, this is a lot, you know, drink three pints of water. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm being some, somewhat, um, yeah, somewhat you're right. But it's, it's like, find that thing that is right for you um I've, I've written a list of of lots of healthy things um but you mentioned gratitude that is a really simple thing to do which is really effective like every day no matter what's happened just think of like three things that you're grateful for and even if it's like I'm grateful for the omelet I had for lunch or because there's, there's been times of my life where I really had to force them out. I did it. I did it publicly on Instagram for a, a whole year once. Yeah. Uh, I supported you through January, I think, but um, I, 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 I couldn't keep it up. The omelet. <laughs> Not on Instagram anyway. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah. And um, you've mentioned journaling as well. Like, I, when I share 
really personal posts on uh, Mrs. Mummy Penny, they are always, they're the most therapeutic to write um, because you know that a lot of people will be reading it that are going through the same thing mm -hmm. as you. And then you just, I mean, this is writing and they're putting out in the public arena, but you get this double impact of the wave coming back of support. So I remember I put a post on um, Instagram, you'll maybe remember it, where I was wearing like a zebra dress and the post on Instagram was like, I'm looking at myself and I hate myself. Like, I hate what I look like. I, I, I have put on weight. I, this is like God to honest truth. I hate what I look like. And I know like we're all bent to be body positivity, blah, 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 blah. I just can't do it. I, I don't want to be fat and overweight. I want to be, you know, the weight I was. You know, I lost all that weight and I was a nice little size 10, 12. Anyway, um, so yeah, I put this picture on Instagram and it was a very honest post just saying, yeah, I hate how I look. I feel really fat. I've gone up to dress sizes, whatever. And literally there's, there's hundreds of comments from people. Not one negative, nasty troll comment. There's so many messages from friends, random people. I mean, just so many people just saying you are beautiful you mm -hmm. are stunning and you you can't help but to like not take it in and i know it's like um oh self-adoration or or whatever being the center of attention but it's it's what i needed at the time because i was feeling just so so low and hating myself that did give me that sort of glimmer of um glimmer of okay maybe it is okay that i'm now two sizes bigger than I was and well, I think a lot of the comments of support as well were uh, you know you're not alone Every, you know yes there was a lot of people and, saying and yeah the difference between you know part particularly I suppose Instagram I mean I think Instagram can be a very supportive community anyway but mm. um we it's often in any form of social media we're presenting the best image and the happiest image of ourselves so I think people always welcome um other people uh saying i feel like crap and i hate how i look and i'm you know it's it's not all picture perfect and uh, 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 and people enjoy that not just from a schadenfreude thing but 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 because they actually recognize that oh god yeah i feel like that too coming back to what you were saying right at the beginning of the session actually that you know that's um that it's the same with mental health. It's the same with anything. I, I, um, I read a post, I want to mention this. Um, I read a post um, by Eve, I want to say Cannon, but I'm not sure that's quite her name. Anyway, I, she's very involved in perinatal um, mental health, women's mental health. Um, she does a phenomenal uh, amount of work in that area. And um, just yesterday she posted and she was talking about her relationship with medication and that she loved her meds and that her, her meds had helped her at times. They had saved her from terrifying hallucinations where she thought she was floating off into the sky or where the world was crashing in on her, where she was literally incapable of um a, a, of doing anything and and i and i just want to mention that because i think you know we, we talked a bit about talking therapy and, and that's that's really good. Um, but, but also, you know, I think there is a place for medication. And I think that we also live in a culture that frowns, generally speaking, on, on, on medication. I don't, I don't totally know how I feel myself, I, but I certainly feel that it needs to be there as, 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 as um, available and that it shouldn't have any shame attached to it, that it yeah. should be something that if you, you need, you can, you can access. So yeah, I wanted to just raise that. As a, as yeah, a... no, totally, totally. And the importance of saying that, and I think Glennon Doyle's another person yeah. who, um, she talks about loving her meds. And I think, again, it's really, it, it's just, it's just Im important to know that some of these things are, are actually beyond us. And it's not just about sitting down, not that there's a just there, but it's sometimes you can't talk your way out of it. Yes. Yeah. But, but that's that, but that always has to be the starting point, doesn't it? You, 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 you just can't keep it all in here. Um, you, you. Well, I think it's always in combination as well, isn't it? I don't think it's a case of people just taking drugs to, um, to be normal um, or to feel normal. It's, it's, it's about doing the work as well that, that I'm sure goes with it. But I'm, you know, I'm speaking from limited experience, so I'm, I'm going to stop on that point. Yeah, no, I've I've never taken any um, 
antidepressants but um again like you i think the doctor tried to prescribe them to me but a um a family member i won't name them um was like no you absolutely cannot take them so that's where i've got that mental yeah. attitude mm. from but um obviously not something that i you want to if you want to take prozac take prozac because yeah. that that still is the standard i think isn't it um so what else do I want to talk about? I want to say that um, if you, right, the NHS, I know we've, we've berated them a little bit for waiting lists and <laughs> rubbish GPs, but they have a really good um, support page on the NHS website. Um, I'll, so I'll pop a link to it in the um, show notes. But um, if you, if you uh, type into Google NHS mental health counselling, they've just got a really great page which explains all the different types of talking therapies. Um, and it's also very explicit by saying you don't have to go to your GP. You can self-refer yourselves mm -hmm. to um, these places. Um, but they've listed um, some charities where you can potentially get help for free. Uh, so Cruz, who you've already mentioned for grief, uh, grief counselling as an adult, um, Grief Encounter, the charity I support, which is grief counselling for children. Um, you've got Rape Crisis. Uh, you have got Relate for relationship issues, which certainly wasn't free when I investigated it. It was like 60 quid an hour. Um, uh, Samaritans, um, I know so many people who have relied heavily on Samaritans and think they are absolutely amazing. I also know people who have been Samaritans, um, you know, the people you can call, the people on the end of the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah do you know what, that's something I was thinking about. I keep getting all these random ideas popping into my head of what is the next big thing I should be doing. And I did wonder whether I should become some sort of like grief counsellor. I don't know if I've got the necessary skills, but I was going to chat to Grief Encounter about what mm, they That's a lovely do. idea. Yeah. Yeah, because when you've got that huge personal experience, you've immediately got that empathy. Um, and what's the other one I wrote down? Oh, victim support. for. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there are free uh, resources out there. And also like I know in um, Stevenage, there's, there's a um, charity, a place called The Living Room where you can go and get um, help for mental health issues and it's, it's free or very low cost. So um, my nephew, the one trained to be a counsellor, he has been in counselling for a couple of years and he said that he's only paying like 10, 15 pounds an hour. So there are ways of getting it, but it's like you've you've really got to investigate and persevere with it, uh, and and of, and of course that's that's that can be hard when you are at your lowest or you yeah know, in control. But 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 definitely, as you say, it's an, it, it encourage you to do it. Encourage anybody who feels that way to do it and to talk. I really do think you know you would be so surprised if you talk to people that you know um, to friends um, that that have been through so many things and will be able to advise you and say, Oh yeah, you know, actually I did go to the doctors or I, I did this instead. Um, and, 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 and I think, you know, fundamentally we're not alone. We're really not alone. Yeah. And that's a really big takeaway and, and, and nothing feels quite as lonely um, as when we're in our own heads and kind of trapped somewhat in our own heads, I think. Yeah. Yeah good place to end it yeah yeah i think so i mean i feel like we've only scratched the surface and mm. i feel like this is a subject that we will want to come back to mm. because um there are so many different facets that we we haven't really been able to go down and we've already you know done what we do every week now which is talk for too long but um yeah it's definitely something to come back to i think so yeah it's been great to talk about it yeah. so all the um all the resources we've mentioned they would all be in the notes um but yeah, don't don't face it alone. Talk, no. talk to somebody, even if it's like your best mate on a WhatsApp. Are you okay today? Yeah. It did annoy me when you'd sometimes say you you're being very quiet. Because I'm like, yeah, I know I'm being quiet. <laughs> it's funny because that was I was writing that rather than saying 
hi how are you doing because i knew you weren't doing very well so i was just saying like i know you're being quiet and i'm just checking in with you that's what i'm doing but if that's annoying i won't do that <laughs> no much much appreciated like i get i get way more from you than from my family so <laughs> hey ho great okay well so as you say let's end it there so thank you very much you have been uh listening to mrs mummy penny talks with ridley wrights um this podcast is produced by lim Beatty. the podcast music is composed and performed by dan greensmith and we have been your hosts for this uh period of time rebecca megson smith and lim Beatty. thank you so much for listening and uh we look forward to talking with you again soon thanks for listening or watching see you next week bye, bye.